Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. The Blue Castle by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 16 Valency had walked out to Roaring Abel's house on the Mistawi's road under a sky of purple and amber, with a queer exhilaration and expectancy in her heart. Back there, behind her, her mother and cousin Stickles were crying, over themselves, not over her. But here the wind was in her face, soft, dew-wet, cool, blowing along the grassy roads. Oh, she loved the wind. The robins were whistling sleepily in the firs along the way and the moist air was fragrant with the tang of balsam. Big cars went purring past in the violet dusk, the stream of summer tourists to Muskoka had already begun, but Valency did not envy any of their occupants. Muskoka cottages might be charming, but beyond, in the sunset skies, among the spires of the firs, her blue castle towered. She brushed the old years and habits and inhibitions away from her like dead leaves. She would not be littered with them. Roaring Abel's rambling, tumble-down old house was situated about three miles from the village, on the very edge of Up Back, as the sparsely settled, hilly, wooded country around Mistawis was called vernacularly. It did not, it must be confessed, look much like a blue castle. It had once been a snug place enough in the days when Abel Gay had been young and prosperous, and the punning, arched sign over the gate, a gay, carpenter, had been fine and freshly painted. Now it was a faded, dreary old place, with a leprous, patched roof and shutters hanging askew. Abel never seemed to do any carpenter jobs about his own house. It had a listless air, as if tired of life. There was a dwindling grove of ragged, crone-like old spruces behind it. The garden, which Sissy used to keep neat and pretty, had run wild. On two sides of the house were fields full of nothing but mullins. Behind the house was a long stretch of useless barrens, full of scrub pines and spruces, with here and there a blossoming bit of wild cherry, running back to a belt of timber on the shores of Lake Mistawis, two miles away. A rough, rocky, boulder-strewn lane ran through it to the woods, a lane white with pestiferous, beautiful daisies. Roaring Abel met Valency at the door. So you've come, he said incredulously. I never supposed that ruck of sterlings would let you. Valency showed all her pointed teeth in a grin. They couldn't stop me. I didn't think you'd so much spunk, said Roaring Abel admiringly. And look at the nice ankles of her, he added, as he stepped aside to let her in. If Cousin Stickles had heard this she would have been certain that Valency's doom, earthly and unearthly, was sealed. But Abel's superannuated gallantry did not worry Valency. Besides, this was the first compliment she had ever received in her life and she found herself liking it. She sometimes suspected she had nice ankles, but nobody had ever mentioned it before. In the Sterling clan ankles were among the unmentionables. Roaring Abel took her into the kitchen, where Sissy Gay was lying on the sofa, breathing quickly, with little scarlet spots on her hollow cheeks. Valency had not seen Cecilia Gay for years. Then she had been such a pretty creature, a slight, blossom-like girl, with soft, golden hair, clear-cut, almost waxen features, and large, beautiful blue eyes. She was shocked at the change in her. Could this be sweet sissy, this pitiful little thing that looked like a tired, broken flower? She had wept all the beauty out of her eyes, they looked too big, enormous, in her wasted face. The last time Valency had seen Cecilia Gay those faded, piteous eyes had been limpid, shadowy blue pools aglow with mirth. The contrast was so terrible that Valency's own eyes filled with tears. She knelt down by Sissy and put her arms about her. Sissy dear, I've come to look after you. I'll stay with you till, till, as long as you want me. Oh. Sissy put her thin arms about Valency's neck. Oh, will you? It's been so, lonely. 
I can wait on myself, but it's been so lonely. It would just be like heaven to have someone here like you. You were always so sweet to me long ago. Valency held Sissy close. She was suddenly happy. Here was someone who needed her, someone she could help. She was no longer a superfluity. Old things had passed away, everything had become new. Most things are predestinated, but some are just darn sheer luck, said Roaring Abel, complacently smoking his pipe in the corner. Chapter 17 When Valency had lived for a week at Roaring Abel she felt as if years had separated her from her old life and all the people she had known in it. They were beginning to seem remote, dreamlike, far away, and as the days went on they seemed still more so, until they ceased to matter altogether. She was happy. Nobody ever bothered her with conundrums or insisted on giving her purple pills. Nobody called her Doss or worried her about catching cold. There were no quilts to peace, no abominable rubber plant to water, no ice-cold maternal tantrums to endure. She could be alone whenever she liked, go to bed when she liked, sneeze when she liked. In the long, wondrous, northern twilights, when Sissy was asleep and roaring Abel away, she could sit for hours on the shaky back veranda steps, looking out over the barrens to the hills beyond, covered with their fine, purple bloom, listening to the friendly wind singing wild, sweet melodies in the little spruces, and drinking in the aroma of the sunned grasses, until darkness flowed over the landscape like a cool, welcome wave. Sometimes of an afternoon, when Sissy was strong enough, the two girls went into the barrens and looked at the wood flowers. But they did not pick any. Valency had read to Sissy the gospel thereof according to John Foster, it is a pity to gather wood flowers. They lose half their witchery away from the green and the flicker. The way to enjoy wood flowers is to track them down to their remote haunts, gloat over them, and then leave them with backward glances, taking with us only the beguiling memory of their grace and fragrance. Valency was in the midst of realities after a lifetime of unrealities. And busy, very busy. The house had to be cleaned. Not for nothing had Valency been brought up in the sterling habits of neatness and cleanliness. If she found satisfaction in cleaning dirty rooms she got her fill of it there. Roaring Abel thought she was foolish to bother doing so much more than she was asked to do, but he did not interfere with her. He was very well satisfied with his bargain. Valency was a good cook. Abel said she got a flavor into things. The only fault he found with her was that she did not sing at her work. Folks should always sing at their work, he insisted. Sounds cheerful like. Not always, retorted Valency. Fancy a butcher singing at his work. Or an undertaker. Abel burst into his great broad laugh. There's no getting the better of you. You've got an answer every time. I should think the Sterlings would be glad to be rid of you. They don't like being sassed back. During the day Abel was generally away from home, if not working, then shooting or fishing with Barney Snaith. He generally came home at nights, always very late and often very drunk. The first night they heard him come howling into the yard, Sissy had told Valency not to be afraid. Father never does anything, he just makes a noise. Valency, lying on the sofa in Sissy's room, where she had elected to sleep, lest Sissy should need attention in the night, Sissy would never have called her, was not at all afraid, and said so. By the time Abel had got his horses put away, the roaring stage had passed and he was in his room at the end of the hall crying and praying. Valency could still hear his dismal moans when she went calmly to sleep. For the most part, Abel was a good-natured creature, but occasionally he had a temper. Once Valency asked him coolly, what is the use of getting in a rage? It's such a d, d relief, said Abel. They both burst out laughing together. You're a great little sport, said Abel admiringly. Don't mind my bad French. I don't mean a thing by it. Just habit. Say, I like a woman that ain't afraid to speak up to me. Sis there was always too meek, 
too meek. That's why she got adrift. I like you. All the same, said Valency determinately, there is no use in sending things to hell as you're always doing. And I'm not going to have you tracking mud all over a floor I've just scrubbed. You must use the scraper whether you consign it to perdition or not. Sissy loved the cleanness and neatness. She had kept it so, too, until her strength failed. She was very pitifully happy because she had Valency with her. It had been so terrible, the long, lonely days and nights with no companionship save those dreadful old women who came to work. Sissy had hated and feared them. She clung to Valency like a child. There was no doubt that Sissy was dying. Yet at no time did she seem alarmingly ill. She did not even cough a great deal. Most days she was able to get up and dress, sometimes even to work about in the garden or the barrens for an hour or two. For a few weeks after Valency's coming she seemed so much better that Valency began to hope she might get well. But Sissy shook her head. No, I can't get well. My lungs are almost gone. And I, don't want to. I'm so tired, Valency. Only dying can rest me. But it's lovely to have you here, you'll never know how much it means to me. But Valency, you work too hard. You don't need to, father only wants his meals cooked. I don't think you are strong yourself. You turn so pale sometimes. And those drops you take. Are you well, dear? I'm all right, said Valency lightly. She would not have Sissy worried. And I'm not working hard. I'm glad to have some work to do, something that really wants to be done. Then, Sissy slipped her hand wistfully into Valency's, don't let's talk any more about my being sick. Let's just forget it. Let's pretend I'm a little girl again, and you have come here to play with me. I used to wish that long ago, wish that you could come. I knew you couldn't, of course. But how I did wish it. You always seemed so different from the other girls, so kind and sweet, and as if you had something in yourself nobody knew about, some dear, pretty secret. Had you, Valency? I had my blue castle, said Valency, laughing a little. She was pleased that Sissy had thought of her like this. She had never suspected that anybody liked or admired or wondered about her. She told Sissy all about her blue castle. She had never told anyone about it before. Everyone has a blue castle, I think, said Sissy softly. Only everyone has a different name for it. I had mine, once. She put her two thin little hands over her face. She did not tell Valency, then, who had destroyed her blue castle. But Valency knew that, whoever it was, it was not Barney Snaith. Chapter 18 Valency was acquainted with Barney by now, well acquainted, it seemed, though she had spoken to him only a few times. But then she had felt just as well acquainted with him the first time they had met. She had been in the garden at twilight, hunting for a few stalks of white narcissus for Sissy's room when she heard that terrible old grey slosson coming down through the woods from Mistawi's, one could hear it miles away. Valency did not look up as it drew near, thumping over the rocks in that crazy lane. She had never looked up, though Barney had gone racketing past every evening since she had been at Roaring Abel's. This time he did not racket past. The old grey slosson stopped with even more terrible noises than it made going. Valency was conscious that Barney had sprung from it and was leaning over the ramshackle gate. She suddenly straightened up and looked into his face. Their eyes met, Valency was suddenly conscious of a delicious weakness. Was one of her heart attacks coming on, but this was a new symptom. His eyes, which she had always thought brown, now seen close, were deep violet, translucent and intense. Neither of his eyebrows looked like the other. He was thin, too thin, she wished she could feed him up a bit, she wished she could sew the buttons on his coat, and make him cut his hair, and shave every day. There was something in his face, one hardly knew what it was. Tiredness? 
sadness, disillusionment. He had dimples in his thin cheeks when he smiled. All these thoughts flashed through Valency's mind in that one moment while his eyes looked into hers. Good evening, Miss Sterling. Nothing could be more commonplace and conventional. Anyone might have said it. But Barney Snaith had a way of saying things that gave them poignancy. When he said good evening you felt that it was a good evening and that it was partly his doing that it was. Also, you felt that some of the credit was yours. Valency felt all this vaguely, but she couldn't imagine why she was trembling from head to foot, it must be her heart. If only he didn't notice it. I'm going over to the port, Barney was saying. Can I acquire merit by getting or doing anything there for you or sissy? Will you get some salt codfish for us, said Valency. It was the only thing she could think of. Roaring Abel had expressed a desire that day for a dinner of boiled salt codfish. When her knights came riding to the Blue Castle, Valency had sent them on many a quest, but she had never asked any of them to get her salt codfish. Certainly. You're sure there's nothing else? Lots of room in Lady Jane Grey Slauson. And she always gets back some time, does Lady Jane? I don't think there's anything more, said Valency. She knew he would bring oranges for Sissy anyhow, he always did. Barney did not turn away at once. He was silent for a little. Then he said, slowly and whimsically, Miss Sterling, you're a brick. You're a whole cartload of bricks. To come here and look after Sissy, under the circumstances. There's nothing so bricky about that, said Valency. I'd nothing else to do. And, I like it here. I don't feel as if I'd done anything specially meritorious. Mr. Gay is paying me fair wages. I never earned any money before, and I like it. It seemed so easy to talk to Barney Snaith, some way, this terrible Barney Snaith of the lurid tales and mysterious past, as easy and natural as if talking to herself. All the money in the world couldn't buy what you're doing for Sissy Gay, said Barney. It's splendid and fine of you. And if there's anything I can do to help you in any way, you have only to let me know. If Roaring Abel ever tries to annoy you, he doesn't. He's lovely to me. I like Roaring Abel, said Valency frankly. So do I. But there's one stage of his drunkenness, perhaps you haven't encountered it yet, when he sings ribald songs, oh, yes. He came home last night like that. Sissy and I just went to our room and shut ourselves in where we couldn't hear him. He apologized this morning. I'm not afraid of any of Roaring Abel's stages. Well, I'm sure he'll be decent to you, apart from his inebriated yowls, said Barney. And I've told him he's got to stop damning things when you're around. Why? asked Valency slyly, with one of her odd, slanted glances and a sudden flake of pink on each cheek, born of the thought that Barney Snaith had actually done so much for her. I often feel like damning things myself. For a moment Barney stared. Was this elfin girl the little, old maidish creature who had stood there two minutes ago? Surely there was magic and devilry going on in that shabby, weedy old garden. Then he laughed. It will be a relief to have someone to do it for you, then. So you don't want anything but salt codfish? Not tonight. But I dare say I'll have some errands for you very often when you go to Port Lawrence. I can't trust Mr. Gay to remember to bring all the things I want. Barney had gone away, then, in his Lady Jane, and Valency stood in the garden for a long time. Since then he had called several times, walking down through the barrens, whistling. How that whistle of his echoed through the spruces on those June twilights. Valency caught herself listening for it every evening, rebuked herself, then let herself go. Why shouldn't she listen for it? He always brought sissy fruit and flowers. Once he brought Valency a box of candy, the first box of candy she had ever been given. It seemed sacrilege to eat it. She found herself thinking of him in season and out of season. 
She wanted to know if he ever thought about her when she wasn't before his eyes, and, if so, what? She wanted to see that mysterious house of his back on the Mistawi's island. Sissy had never seen it. Sissy, though she talked freely of Barney and had known him for five years, really knew little more of him than Valency herself. But he isn't bad, said Sissy. Nobody need ever tell me he is. He can't have done a thing to be ashamed of. Then why does he live as he does, asked Valency, to hear somebody defend him. I don't know. He's a mystery. And of course there's something behind it, but I know it isn't disgrace. Barney Snaith simply couldn't do anything disgraceful, Valency. Valency was not so sure. Barney must have done something, sometime. He was a man of education and intelligence. She had soon discovered that, in listening to his conversations and wrangles with Roaring Abel, who was surprisingly well-read and could discuss any subject under the sun when sober. Such a man wouldn't bury himself for five years in Muskoka and live and look like a tramp if there were not too good, or bad, a reason for it. But it didn't matter. All that mattered was that she was sure now that he had never been Sissy Gay's lover. There was nothing like that between them. Though he was very fond of Sissy and she of him, as anyone could see. But it was a fondness that didn't worry Valency. You don't know what Barney has been to me, these past two years, Sissy had said simply. Everything would have been unbearable without him. Sissy Gay is the sweetest girl I ever knew, and there's a man somewhere I'd like to shoot if I could find him, Barney had said savagely. Barney was an interesting talker, with a knack of telling a great deal about his adventures and nothing at all about himself. There was one glorious rainy day when Barney and Abel swapped yarns all the afternoon while Valency mended tablecloths and listened. Barney told weird tales of his adventures with shacks on trains while hoboing it across the continent. Valency thought she ought to think his stealing rides quite dreadful, but didn't. The story of his working his way to England on a cattle ship sounded more legitimate. And his yarns of the Yukon enthralled her, especially the one of the night he was lost on the divide between Gold Run and Sulphur Valley. He had spent two years out there. Where in all this was there room for the penitentiary and the other things? If he were telling the truth. But Valency knew he was. Found no gold, he said. Came away poorer than when I went. But such a place to live. Those silences at the back of the north wind got me. I've never belonged to myself since. Yet he was not a great talker. He told a great deal in a few well-chosen words, how well-chosen Valency did not realize. And he had a knack of saying things without opening his mouth at all. I like a man whose eyes say more than his lips, thought Valency. But then she liked everything about him, his tawny hair, his whimsical smiles, the little glints of fun in his eyes, his loyal affection for that unspeakable Lady Jane, his habit of sitting with his hands in his pockets, his chin sunk on his breast, looking up from under his mismated eyebrows. She liked his nice voice which sounded as if it might become caressing or wooing with very little provocation. She was at times almost afraid to let herself think these thoughts. They were so vivid that she felt as if the others must know what she was thinking. I've been watching a woodpecker all day, he said one evening on the shaky old back veranda. His account of the woodpecker's doings was satisfying. He had often some gay or cunning little anecdote of the wood folk to tell them. And sometimes he and Roaring Abel smoked fiercely the whole evening and never said a word, while Sissy lay in the hammock swung between the veranda posts and Valency sat idly on the steps, her hands clasped over her knees, and wondered dreamily if she were really Valency Sterling and if it were only three weeks since she had left the ugly old house on Elm Street. The barons lay before her in a white moon splendor, where dozens of little rabbits frisked. Barney, when he liked, could sit down on the edge of the barons and lure those rabbits right to him by some mysterious sorcery he possessed. Valency had once seen a squirrel leap from a scrub pine to his shoulder and sit there chattering to him. 
it reminded her of John Foster. It was one of the delights of Valency's new life that she could read John Foster's books as often and as long as she liked. She could read them in bed if she wanted to. She read them all to Sissy, who loved them. She also tried to read them to Abel and Barney, who did not love them. Abel was bored and Barney politely refused to listen at all. Piffle, said Barney. Chapter 19 Of course, the Sterlings had not left the poor maniac alone all this time or refrained from heroic efforts to rescue her perishing soul and reputation. Uncle James, whose lawyer had helped him as little as his doctor, came one day and, finding Valency alone in the kitchen, as he supposed, gave her a terrible talking to, told her she was breaking her mother's heart and disgracing her family. But why, said Valency, not ceasing to scour her porridge pot decently. I'm doing honest work for honest pay. What is there in that that is disgraceful? Don't quibble, Valency, said Uncle James solemnly. This is no fit place for you to be, and you know it. Why, I'm told that jailbird, Snaith, is hanging around here every evening. Not every evening, said Valency reflectively. No, not quite every evening. It's, it's insufferable, said Uncle James violently. Valency, you must come home. We won't judge you harshly. I assure you we won't. We will overlook all this. Thank you, said Valency. Have you no sense of shame, demanded Uncle James. Oh, yes. But the things I am ashamed of are not the things you are ashamed of. Valency proceeded to rinse her dishcloth meticulously. Still was Uncle James patient. He gripped the sides of his chair and ground his teeth. We know your mind isn't just right. We'll make allowances. But you must come home. You shall not stay here with that drunken, blasphemous old scoundrel, were you by any chance referring to me, Mr. Sterling, demanded Roaring Abel, suddenly appearing in the doorway of the back veranda where he had been smoking a peaceful pipe and listening to old Jim Sterling's tirade with huge enjoyment. His red beard fairly bristled with indignation and his huge eyebrows quivered. But cowardice was not among James Sterling's shortcomings. I was. And, furthermore, I want to tell you that you have acted an iniquitous part in luring this weak and unfortunate girl away from her home and friends, and I will have you punished yet for it, James Sterling got no further. Roaring Abel crossed the kitchen at a bound, caught him by his collar and his trousers, and hurled him through the doorway and over the garden paling with as little apparent effort as he might have employed in whisking a troublesome kitten out of the way. The next time you come back here, he bellowed, I'll throw you through the window, and all the better if the window is shut. Coming here, thinking yourself God to put the world to rights. Valency candidly and unashamedly owned to herself that she had seen few more satisfying sights than Uncle James' coattails flying out into the asparagus bed. She had once been afraid of this man's judgment. Now she saw clearly that he was nothing but a rather stupid little village tin god. Roaring Abel turned with his great broad laugh. He'll think of that for years when he wakes up in the night. The Almighty made a mistake in making so many sterlings. But since they are made, we've got to reckon with them. Too many to kill out. But if they come here bothering you I'll shoo am off before a cat could lick its ear. The next time they sent Dr. Stalling. Surely Roaring Abel would not throw him into asparagus beds. Dr. Stalling was not so sure of this and had no great liking for the task. He did not believe Valency Sterling was out of her mind. She had always been queer. He, Dr. Stalling, had never been able to understand her. Therefore, beyond doubt, she was queer. She was only just a little queerer than usual now. And Dr. Stalling had his own reasons for disliking Roaring Abel. When Dr. Stalling had first come to Deerwood he had had a liking for long hikes around Mistawis and Muskoka. On one of these occasions he had got lost and after much wandering had fallen in with Roaring Abel with his gun over his shoulder. 
Dr. Stalling had contrived to ask his question in about the most idiotic manner possible. He said, Can you tell me where I'm going? How the devil should I know where you're going, Gosling, retorted Abel contemptuously. Dr. Stalling was so enraged that he could not speak for a moment or two and in that moment Abel had disappeared in the woods. Dr. Stalling had eventually found his way home, but he had never hankered to encounter Abel Gay again. Nevertheless he came now to do his duty. Valency greeted him with a sinking heart. She had to own to herself that she was terribly afraid of Dr. Stalling still. She had a miserable conviction that if he shook his long, bony finger at her and told her to go home, she dared not disobey. Mr. Gay, said Dr. Stalling politely and condescendingly, may I see Miss Sterling alone for a few minutes? Roaring Abel was a little drunk, just drunk enough to be excessively polite and very cunning. He had been on the point of going away when Dr. Stalling arrived, but now he sat down in a corner of the parlor and folded his arms. No, no, mister, he said solemnly. That wouldn't do, wouldn't do at all. I've got the reputation of my household to keep up. I've got to chaperone this young lady. Can't have any spark in going on here behind my back. Outraged Dr. Stalling looked so terrible that Valency wondered how Abel could endure his aspect. But Abel was not worried at all. Do you know anything about it, anyway? he asked genially. About what? Sparking, said Abel coolly. Poor Dr. Stalling, who had never married because he believed in a celibate clergy, would not notice this ribald remark. He turned his back on Abel and addressed himself to Valency. Miss Sterling, I am here in response to your mother's wishes. She begged me to come. I am charged with some messages from her. Will you, he wagged his forefinger, will you hear them? Yes, said Valency faintly, eyeing the forefinger. It had a hypnotic effect on her. The first is this. If you will leave this, this, house, interjected Roaring Abel. H-O-U-S-E troubled with an impediment in your speech, ain't you, mister? This place and return to your home, Mr. James Sterling will himself pay for a good nurse to come here and wait on Miss Gay. Back of her terror Valency smiled in secret. Uncle James must indeed regard the matter as desperate when he would loosen his purse strings like that. At any rate, her clan no longer despised her or ignored her. She had become important to them. That's my business, mister, said Abel. Miss Sterling can go if she pleases, or stay if she pleases. I made a fair bargain with her, and she's free to conclude it when she likes. She gives me meals that stick to my ribs. She don't forget to put salt in the porridge. She never slams doors, and when she has nothing to say she don't talk. That's uncanny in a woman, you know, mister. I'm satisfied. If she isn't, she's free to go. But no woman comes here in Jim Sterling's pay. If anyone does, Abel's voice was uncannily bland and polite, I'll spatter the road with her brains. Tell him that with a gaze compliments. Dr. Stalling, a nurse is not what Sissy needs, said Valency earnestly. She isn't so ill as that, yet. What she wants is companionship, somebody she knows and likes just to live with her. You can understand that, I'm sure. I understand that your motive is quite, ahem, commendable. Dr. Stalling felt that he was very broad-minded indeed, especially as in his secret soul he did not believe Valency's motive was commendable. He hadn't the least idea what she was up to, but he was sure her motive was not commendable. When he could not understand a thing he straightway condemned it. Simplicity itself. But your first duty is to your mother. She needs you. She implores you to come home, she will forgive everything if you will only come home. That's a pretty little thought, remarked Abel meditatively, as he ground some tobacco up in his hand. Dr. Stalling ignored him. She entreats, but I, Miss Sterling, Dr. Stalling remembered that he was an ambassador of Jehovah, I command. As your pastor and spiritual guide, I command you to come home with me, 
this very day. Get your hat and coat and come now. Dr. Stalling shook his finger at Valancy. Before that pitiless finger she drooped and wilted visibly. She's giving in, thought Roaring Abel. She'll go with him. Beats all, the power these preacher fellows have over women. Valancy was on the point of obeying Dr. Stalling. She must go home with him, and give up. She would lapse back to Dawes Sterling again and for her few remaining days or weeks be the cowed, futile creature she had always been. It was her fate, typified by that relentless, uplifted forefinger. She could no more escape from it than roaring Abel from his predestination. She eyed it as the fascinated bird eyes the snake. Another moment, fear is the original sin, suddenly said a still, small voice away back, back, back of Valancy's consciousness. Almost all the evil in the world has its origin in the fact that someone is afraid of something. Valancy stood up. She was still in the clutches of fear, but her soul was her own again. She would not be false to that inner voice. Dr. Stalling, she said slowly, I do not at present owe any duty to my mother. She is quite well, she has all the assistance and companionship she requires, she does not need me at all. I am needed here. I am going to stay here. There's spunk for you, said Roaring Abel admiringly. Dr. Stalling dropped his forefinger. One could not keep on shaking a finger forever. Miss Sterling, is there nothing that can influence you? Do you remember your childhood days, perfectly? And hate them? Do you realize what people will say? What they are saying? I can imagine it, said Valancy, with a shrug of her shoulders. She was suddenly free of fear again. I haven't listened to the gossip of Deerwood tea parties and sewing circles twenty years for nothing. But, Dr. Stalling, it doesn't matter in the least to me what they say, not in the least. Dr. Stalling went away then. A girl who cared nothing for public opinion. Over whom sacred family ties had no restraining influence. Who hated her childhood memories. Then cousin Georgiana came, on her own initiative, for nobody would have thought it worth while to send her. She found Valancy alone, weeding the little vegetable garden she had planted, and she made all the platitudinous pleas she could think of. Valancy heard her patiently. Cousin Georgiana wasn't such a bad old soul. Then she said, and now that you have got all that out of your system, Cousin Georgiana, can you tell me how to make creamed codfish so that it will not be as thick as porridge and as salt as the Dead Sea? Asterisk 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 asterisk, we'll just have to wait, said Uncle Benjamin. After all, Sissy Gay can't live long. Dr. Marsh tells me she may drop off any day. Mrs. Frederick wept. It would really have been so much easier to bear if Valancy had died. She could have worn mourning then. 